on the 30th of November 2021, Barbados became a republic. It was the 55th anniversary of becoming independent from the United Kingdom. Given the brutality of the colonial period, this decision is not only perfectly understandable, it is the right thing to do. Let's have a quick look at the location of Barbados on the map. It's located in the Lesser Antilles of the West Indies, in the Caribbean region, although perhaps not in the Caribbean Sea. I would say it is in the Atlantic, but it is the most easterly of all the Caribbean islands. It is 30 kilometers long, and at its widest point, it is 23 kilometers. It covers an area of 432 square kilometers. Now, this is a history channel, so let's have a look at its history. It is not known from whence came the first Europeans who saw it. However, the native population may have been reduced by slave raiding by Spanish mariners. On the 14th of May 1625, Captain John Powell landed and claimed the land for King James I of England, but not for the same King James, who was also King James VI of Scotland. He must have liked it so much that his younger brother Henry came back on the 17th of February 1627 with 80 settlers and 10 indentured labourers. An indentured labourer, in this case, is someone who did not have the financial resources to pay for their passage across the Atlantic and so therefore agrees to work it off over a period of time. Why would they want to do a passage across the Atlantic? Probably because they didn't have land at home or the land was too poor or something along those lines. The settlement was funded by City of London merchant Sir William Corton, who thus acquired the title to Barbados and several other islands. Although he'd never been there himself, nor had any other right to the land other than having footed the bill to pay for the ship to go there, he became the landowner and the colonists were his tenants. In this way, he recuperated the costs of funding the trip there and the colonists' initial outlay, which would have been made in Bristol or London or wherever in England. So he would have paid for whatever they took with them. For most of the 17th century, the West Indies was the destination of preference for emigrants from England rather than the American colonies. Most of these emigrants were indentured. Normally they had to work for five years to pay for the cost of their journey. At the end of this five years, they were given 10 pounds worth of goods and they were free to work for whomever they wanted. Within a very short time, there was no more free land to rent from the owners in London, so they had to work for one of the tenants. With Cromwell's war in Ireland in the 1650s, a large number of Irish prisoners were captured or kidnapped, and they were sent, in some cases, to Barbados, as well as, of course, going to other places, and used as labourers. There were four main crops, other than subsistence agriculture, which were tobacco, cotton, ginger, and indigo. In 1640, sugarcane was introduced. This tiny island in time would become one of the world's largest suppliers of sugar. At this time, approximately only 3% of the island's population was African, but this was now about to change. The smallholders lost their land and emigrated to other islands or to the American colonies. Huge sugar plantations took over. There was little point in using indentured labour because the labourer might leave when their time was up and had certain rights, whereas slaves were there forever and had no rights whatsoever. African slaves kidnapped and transported there equaled free whites within 20 years. By 1680, 
there were 20,000 free whites and 46,000 enslaved Africans. By 1724, 18,000 free whites and 55,000 enslaved Africans. 1750, the same amount of whites, 18,000, but now 65,000 slaves. The slaves were usually treated with the utmost cruelty as overseers tried to get the maximum labor out of them for the minimum cost. The first slave code, the rules on the treatment of slaves, went into law in Barbados. That was the first in the world, I believe. By 1660, Barbados generated more trade than all the other English colonies combined. After Boston and Port Royal, Jamaica, Bridgetown, the capital, was the largest town in English America. In 1680, there were 175 plantations producing sugar and most food was imported. In 1807, the slave trade was made illegal and the British government set up patrols on the West African coast to enforce this. Slavery was abolished in 1833, with a transition period until 1839, when the slaves were called apprentices and had to stay on the land for six more years doing their old jobs. The British government budgeted £20 million to compensate slave owners, which was quite a lot in the days when the Treasury received around £50 million a year. This was financed by bonds and some slave owners could choose to take a 3.5 annuity instead and this money was paid until 2015. That is the year 2015, not quarter past eight. What about the slaves? What did they get? Well, they got their freedom. Freedom to do the same job as before. Freedom to live in the same place as before. Freedom to accept payment for their labor, but if they didn't, they would starve. It was not as though they were going to go anywhere or find another job. So now the slave owners got compensation for the slaves they owned, thanks to the generosity of the British taxpayer, but now no longer needed to provide for them when they were no longer productive. They didn't have to look after them as infants or when they were elderly or feed or care for them when they were sick. And with the introduction of sugar beet in Europe, cane sugar could no longer command the same prices, so they were winners all round. What should have happened, of course, is that the former slaves should have been given land in order to support themselves, but that would have gone against the interests of the landed aristocracy who had strong political support in the British Parliament, and the former slaves had next to none. I believe when the Civil War ended in the United States in 1865, that large plantations should have been broken up and given to the slaves who had worked there previously. There was no reason to allow the traitors who had supported the Confederacy to keep their plantations. This would have given the former slaves the ability to produce their own food for their own needs. Now, I do of course appreciate that one cannot just stop being a field hand and going into subsistence food production or even market gardening from one year to the next, but steps along these lines would not only have been fair, but they may have stopped a resurgence of the traitors in the South who had tried to break up the Union. I am justifying a humanitarian approach with a political reason. Anyway, of course, we're talking about Barbados, and in Barbados, this was not possible. The large plantations of the former slave owners largely exist to this day. One such former plantation belongs to this man, Richard Grosvenor Plunkett Ernley Early Drax. His family has owned Drax Hall, a plantation in Barbados, since the 17th century. Drax Hall has been described by the Caribbean Communities Reparations Commission as a killing field and a crime scene from the tens of thousands of African slaves who died there in terrible conditions between 1640 and 1836. Drax is a member of parliament for South Dorset and is possibly the wealthiest landowner in the House of Commons. According to The Guardian, he has 5,600 
600 hectares of farmland and woodlands. The estate's finances are largely opaque to the public gaze and involve at least six trusts and other disconnected financial entities. Therefore, it is of no surprise whatsoever to know that he was a major Brexit supporter because the last thing he would want is the European Union putting a stop to tax havens and murky financial trusts. Now, of course, Drax is not responsible at all for what his ancestors did and he has said that the events of the past are terrible. But they are in the past. He does not condone his ancestors. However, it was those very terrible events that not only allowed him to now own the plantation in Barbados, but for his family to have bought such large land holdings in the United Kingdom. What could he do? Well, I'm not suggesting that his land holdings in the UK, acquired through the criminal use of slaves in the West Indies, should be disposed of, even if the United Kingdom, in theory, has laws against the proceeds of crime. However, I think he ought to do something towards the descendants of his ancestors' victims and maybe give the plantation to the people of Barbados or a similar gesture. Maybe, alternatively, he could use the proceeds to start a hospital or a school or something like that. As it stands, the profits from this plantation are now being repatriated to the UK or more likely a tax haven which is part of the UK. And this happens throughout poorer countries. The wealth of the poorer countries is taken by people from the wealthy countries. Now, on his website, Drax attacks immigration, but it is his private greed that means that people in those countries are poorer, meaning that they want or have to leave. Now, I think Drax should do something and thus gain the kudos from having done something before the government of Barbados does it for him. What could they do? Well, one thing they could do is they could nationalise without compensation, the plantation. When I was a child and the United Kingdom uh, no longer had an empire, but it did have the recent memory of one, the general consensus was that the empire was something positive and something to be proud of. I had a map on my wall a copy of a poster from 1898 showing the British Empire. But the empire only worked for the wealthy in the UK. People like Drax. It was something positive for the establishment elite. Drax and his mates, but a never-ending nightmare for the victims in places like Barbados. Therefore, I absolutely understand why the government of Barbados should want to break this link with its colonial oppressors. What will, of course, happen is that one day compensation will be paid, but that payment will be made once more by the taxpayers and not the likes of Drax, who have access now to these offshore murky funds, thanks to the fact that the United Kingdom is no longer in the European Union. That was a bit different from the sort of thing I normally do, but in view of the anniversary of this happening, I decided to, to do this, and I do feel quite strongly about uh, things of this nature. Uh, I might return to one or two things uh, related to British colonialism in other videos, but uh, it's not my specialist area. My specialist area is, of course, 20th century European history, and that is probably what the next video will be about.